Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I'm uh, pleased. I was, used to be here for, uh, in California for quite a few years. And um, in fact, the first time I, I, uh, I came here about 25 years ago, John Taylor invited me to give uh, a lecture at uh, a course on fungal genetics he was um, teaching. And, um, and I made the mistake, and I arrived 15 minutes too late. I had the wrong time. So by that time, the students were, were uh, waiting for the lecture, but they didn't show up. So, uh, so I have a, a bit of a, a, a bad memory. For the last time I was a postdoc here. Anyways, I figured uh, Barbara and Nick would have introduced plant pathogens uh, to you by now. So I thought my first slide would be this one. And this is a shot I took in uh, Cuba a few years ago. Uh, so the question is, uh, what's on this slide? What do you see? Anyone? No? A rooster. Well, the wrong answer, because that's a single individual representative of the animal kingdom, but there's dozens of plant species. And you guys haven't seen them because you suffer from plant blindness, which I'm very pleased to see that uh, the organizers of SEND don't, don't suffer from, uh, because uh, plants are important. Uh, we need plants to live every day. We, you, plants are food, and we need food to survive. So uh, one of my colleagues says that uh, Medicine may save your life someday, but plants save your life every day. So remember that. <laughs> so uh, anyways, very pleased really to, to be part of this, uh, this program, which is unusual to actually mix up uh, both plant and animal pathogens. OK, so uh, we also lose, as you heard, we lose a lot of uh, food to, um, to plant pathogens. And uh, the groups I've been interested in are the filamentous pathogens. These are very diverse because these are not just fungi, but also mice. In fact, for most of my career, I've worked on, on the potato blight pathogen, which is the famous Irish potato famine pathogen. Uh, but more recently, I started working also on the blast fungus. And so this is taken from uh, an article in Science about, was it now seven years ago, which highlighted some of the uh, immediate threats to, uh, to agriculture and food security. And, and these are some of the these famous pathogens are, are shown here. So uh, my entry to, uh, to the blast fungus uh, really can be traced back to about five years ago and to this uh, little column I, I wrote at that time. I was getting a little irritated by how slow plant pathologists were in terms of responding to emergencies. Uh, we have new um, outbreaks all the time, new emergent diseases, as you just heard. Uh, with the last two talks, and uh, we're not very good at quickly sequencing the genomes and also releasing them uh, to the community. And, and that really uh, has a stifling effect, I think, on, on the community, the research community, getting engaging with some of these new problems that, that show up. So I was getting a little irritated about that, and I, was, uh, I wrote this, this column that we were too slow, and, 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 and also not just slow in terms of sequencing, but slow in releasing the data and sharing it with the community. So this is uh, a little bit my rant here. I'll start with that. So I, I do feel, and I think many of you would agree, that the traditional structure of science, uh, whether it's the funding, uh, the, the way we collaborate, and the way also we publish our data is just simply not appropriate for emergencies. Uh, and, and we just um, haven't been very good at doing that with plant pathology. So uh, soon after I wrote that column, I was sort of uh, on the lookout for uh, problems to, uh, to apply a different approach um, to, uh, than the traditional way of doing science. And there was indeed an outbreak that uh, happened in the UK in 2012. Uh, and and uh, it was, in fact, detected uh, not far from uh, where I work in, in Norfolk. Uh, and in October 2012, and it received a lot of a uh, lot of press coverage. I mean, in fact, this is very unusual because the Bond special was, I think, there's James Bond there, and gets a little bit the corner there, and the plant pathogen gets most of the cover of the Telegraph. So that was that was unusual. Uh, so, anyways, with my colleagues in particular, with Dan McLean and also Diane Saunders, who's now a group leader at the John Innes Institute, we decided to tackle this, and we used an open source approach, an open science approach, where we sequenced the genome very quickly uh, and the transcriptome and, and released the data and, and really went after the community and, 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 and asked people to help us. And the response of the community was tremendous. We got a lot of help, a lot of support, a lot of feedback. Uh, and this led to uh, very quickly identifying the uh, identity of the pathogen, not just the species, but really knowing what kind of, what kind of strain we have, what kind of, um, what kind of populations, and, and, and this really helped guide later on the 
uh, deployment of uh, identification and deployment of some uh, resistant, uh, resistant trees. So that's how, how this uh, started, but I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. I mean, ash dieback is an important disease. It's bad for the environment, but that's not really important for uh, food security. And I was on the lookout for a problem like this to, uh, to also tackle. And that's when the uh, wheat blast outbreak happened. This is a little less than two years ago now. Uh, so in um, uh, late February 2016, there were these reports that in Bangladesh there was an outbreak of wheat blast. I think you heard about this by now. Uh, pretty serious, affected 15,000 hectares and all that. And then I, I, uh, I knew a Bangladeshi scientist whom I met at, uh, at a conference, and uh, we were actually friends on Facebook, so I sent him a Facebook message. And I said, hey, can you get some samples here? And, uh, and Tofazal Islam, that's, that's him, he, uh, he was a very dynamic guy, and he immediately got uh, on Facebook and, and actually uh, managed to get a lot of uh, farmers to help him out and, 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 and uh, and get him samples uh, of, uh, of the wheat blast and, and, uh, and, and send them over to us. And, and we, we, we didn't do much. We just really sequenced uh, these samples and, and put them on this uh, open uh, website, open wheat blast. And I wasn't really working on blast at the time, so I, I, I just didn't know much about it. But we, we got help for a lot of people in the community, and, and there was a lot of uh, media coverage, which was important for uh, really getting everyone's attention. And, and the response of the community was tremendous. And uh, what happened is, very quickly, uh, samples were collected uh, March 16th, uh, two weeks after those uh, news reports. And within six weeks, we start having um, reports being posted online uh, by uh, members of the community. So uh, Daniel Kroll was one of them. And, and many people, such as Nick's lab, contributed several genomes. So one of the uh, interesting things that happened here, which I think is an important lesson, is by the time we went public, there was only one single genome of wheat blast isolate that was available, that was publicly available. And, and six weeks later, there was 23. So uh, people had actually genomes sitting on their servers, but they weren't really uh, publicly available. So the, the strategy really also galvanized everyone to share their data and contribute. And, um, so anyway, so it went very fast, and, and uh, three months after the samples were collected, we had the paper posted, and as you can see here, and as you heard already, uh, it turned out that this uh, pathogen was uh, very likely introduced from South America, most probably through import of uh, infected uh, wheat, uh, which the Bangladeshi did import from uh, South America, from Brazil in particular, a few months before, uh, before the outbreak. And, and then three months after that, so six months after the um, samples were collected, we had the formal uh, publication uh, posted. So uh, it all went very fast. This is, uh, this is how we did it, by the way. Uh, so just to show you some uh, data, the way we did it to just go faster and not uh, go through the process of culturing the fungus and all that, we directly sequenced uh, RNA uh, extracted from uh, infected uh, leaf tissue. So these are blast lesions, and even if you have very little fungus, in this case, there was only 0.5% of the reeds were from the fungus, so most of it, over 99% was from wheat, uh, we, we could still identify the, uh, the fungal reeds and, and also identify and type the, uh, the strain that was uh, causing this outbreak. So it was uh, a very quick way and very efficient way to uh, by using RNA-seq to, to identify the, the fungus. And this is some of the data here, uh, just to show you again that the uh, wheat blast from Bangladesh was nested uh, very well within the, uh, the uh, Brazilian and uh, South American strains. As Barbara mentioned now, the closest uh, uh, South American relative is the strain from, uh, from Bolivia, B71. Okay, so uh, a brief update on uh, what happened in 2017. And as you heard, so one year after the uh, introduction to Bangladesh, uh, the pathogen has moved to India. It's been detected in West Bengal, uh, which is the state that neighbors uh, Bangladesh. And it's very scary because it could spread uh, further. And if it reaches Uttar Pradesh, which is really uh, not that far away from, uh, from this whole area, is, uh, that would be really dramatic because um, Uttar Pradesh is the breadbasket of India, and, uh, and that would be uh, really dramatic. It's also a very poor state 
with uh, over 200 million uh, people living there. Uh, so it is scary, but as, as Barbara mentioned, the uh, response from the Indian government has been uh, quite pathetic, to be honest, uh, because they are not um, open in terms of really sharing information. And, and uh, we haven't also, uh, none of us have received uh, isolates or uh, even uh, DNA or RNA samples from, uh, from India, so we can't, we can't say much about what goes on there. One, one question that I find uh, important is uh, to find out whether the, this wheat blast strain can uh, jump to other uh, grasses. Uh, for example, uh, it's known that uh, some of the strains, including this Bangladeshi strain, can infect uh, maize, for instance, and uh, that's important because often planted next to wheat. Uh, but there's other grasses that are potential hosts, and this is important because if the wheat blast strain would move to uh, other grasses, then there's a potential for it to exchange genetic, genetic material with some of the endemic Bangladeshi strains. And that's, uh, that's uh, obviously uh, could be problematic. And so, um, so this is something that uh, is something we're keeping uh, in mind and we want to monitor, but hasn't been, uh, so far there has been no report of at least field host jump uh, from wheat to other, other grasses. Uh, but we are uh, stepping up with uh, Tofazal the uh, surveillance and uh, monitoring. And to do that, we uh, worked with uh, this company, uh, uh, Floodlight Genomics uh, in North Carolina. This is uh, Kurt Lamour's company. And um, he uh, uh, has a, a very cheap and efficient uh, multiplex uh, SNP typing. Uh, and we did that for 85 SNPs that we selected as being um, diagnostic of the Bangladeshi lineage. And as you can see that all the Bangladeshi strains can be very easily distinguished from other uh, wheat blast or other uh, lineages of Magnapotheorizer. So this is uh, a system where we can, uh, we can test hundreds of samples and, and this is something we're hoping to do this year in particular to uh, monitor for uh, any potential host jump to other grasses. This obviously can also be used to detect the second incursion. Uh, they could obviously be additional incursions of uh, other uh, wheat blasts to, uh, to the region. So it's, uh, it's a useful uh, data set or use, useful approach to, uh, to apply to this, this problem. Okay, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to uh, switch gears and, uh, and uh, ask the question of how can we exploit the knowledge we have about these pathogen genomes and also some of the fundamental concepts we have about plant microbe interactions to uh, address this problem of wheat blast. And so, um, so that's what I will do next. And, and our field in plant microbe interactions has really matured a lot. We now have a very good knowledge of the fundamentals of how plant and microbes interact. And you heard this already from Barbara and Nick. So we know that these pathogens secrete effectors and we know that the plant has uh, a variety of immune receptors that can detect these effectors. And these dynamics are very well understood. We have the, the basic uh, components of these interactions are well known and can be also fairly easily identified from uh, genomes of pathogens and host plants. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of a primer here uh, on, on, uh, on plant microbe interactions. I think you heard a little bit of this already, but I think it's useful to go through this because there is an aspect that's relevant to what I will talk to you next. So you already heard that pathogens secrete effectors. These effectors have targets and they use to uh, modulate processes in the host, in particular to suppress responses. And we also know that various pathogens tend to uh, zoom in and, and, and go after the same targets. And this makes sense because there is a limited uh, components in the cell, the plant cell that are involved, for example, in defense and immunity. So it makes sense that different pathogens would actually target these. And, and, uh, and these effector targets tend to be uh, sort of hubs for, uh, for effector activity. And, and you already heard that uh, this effector can also trip the wire. This is the uh, so-called avirulence. This is a plant pathology term that's very confusing, I think, to many of you. But in any case, these effectors occasionally can trip the wire and activate immunity. And uh, this is through detection by these sensors that plants have, uh, the immune receptors, the NLRs, which of course are are also present in animals and mammals. And I see Russell, Russell Vance there, and so I suppose you're familiar with, with NLRs. So, um, so plants have NLRs too, and they can detect these effectors uh, 
by, and, and in that case, we say that the effector has an avalanche activity, but essentially the effector really evolved to suppress immunity or perturb plant processes. Well, something quite amazing happened in the field of plant microbe interactions in the last years. There was a discovery that is, I think is fundamental and really striking. It turned out that there is, throughout evolution, some of these effector targets have integrated into these NLR receptors and became essentially baits or decoys or sensors for the effectors. So this is something that is really striking, happened in a subset of the NLRs, maybe about 5% perhaps. And, and, and this is quite fantastic really for me because I initially work on effectors and now all of a sudden we have this merger between the two fields, the field of effector biology and the field of NLR biology, which really have coalesced now through this uh, amazing evolutionary process where uh, some NLR receptors have acquired these effectors integrated them and use them now as baits for, for these pathogens. And uh, here's an, uh, and, and this is, I mean, what's really striking about it, so I go back to this, what's, what's really interesting about this, if you think about it, is that throughout evolution, these, these guys here, the effect of targets, are really susceptibility factors that are being manipulated by the pathogen, but once they integrate, they immediately flip, and now they become actually components of the immune response where they're actually sensing the, uh, the pathogen effect. And there's a lot of exciting work going on now in understanding the evolution of these integrated domains, as we call them, uh, after they integrate and how they actually change. Because they essentially, in, in just one, one go, they just flip and, and have a completely different uh, function within the plant. Okay, so, uh, and the pathogens, of course, are evolving, and this is also a theme that's very dominant in our field. You already had a sense of that, that these pathogens are continuously evolving due to pressure from the plant, obviously, uh, but they evolve in many different ways, and it's important to review that. So effectors evolve by adapting to new targets. This is one of the uh, driving forces of effector evolution. So, uh, for example, after host jump, let's say there's a jump to wheat, so now all of a sudden, they're actually faced by a different environment. There's different effector targets, different targets in the wheat plant compared to other hosts. And so these effectors will acquire adaptive mutations to adapt to that new host. But also effectors evolve to evade the immune receptors. And this is quite a challenge for these effectors because they will create stealthy variants, for example. So these are variants that will not be detected by the, by the immune receptor, by the NLR, but are still able to do the virulence function. So they're still able to to bind that virulence um, target or that effector target. And so this is quite uh, a restraint, if you like, or constraint, an evolutionary constraint on these effectors because they have, they have a limited space of, of mutation they can acquire really to, uh, to do that, to evade the, the receptor, but at the same time to, um, to maintain the capacity to bind the target, especially if the receptor is detecting the effector through that a version of that target that that they're going after, right? So this is why we see a lot of, re lot of gene losses, a lot of pseudogenization, and there's also a lot of redundancy in the system, which is probably a form of bet hedging that this pathogen use to really be able to, to persist in the population. So they have many effectors that will do the same job, and that, that's, that way, if one of these is detected by an immune receptor, they can afford to uh, delete it if they can't evolve stealthy versions. So the reason I'm telling you all this is this is really setting up the effector I'm going to talk about. And this is, this is an effector called AVRPIK, which targets these proteins in the host plant. Uh, and this is an effector from the rice blast fungus. Uh, and these proteins are called HMA proteins, heavy metal associated proteins, not important for uh, the talk to know what, what they are, what they do. Uh, keep in mind that these are actually uh, negative regulators of immunity. So they essentially stabilized or uh, promoted really by the effector to uh, do better job of suppressing immunity. So these effectors are essentially acting on these HMA proteins to um, suppress and negatively regulate uh, plant immunity against the blast fungus. But what's remarkable is these, these domains, these HMA domains have integrated into NLRs and they integrated at least twice in rice in two different NLRs. One is the PIK1 uh, NLR, and that's the one that detects AVRPIK, and then another one is called RGA5, and that detects an effector called AVRPIA. So this uh, HMA domain has been um, essentially 
co-opted by NLRs to detect these effectors. So I'm talking about AVRPIK here, so that's the one I would talk about. And so this guy, again, binds HMAs to suppress defense, but in plants that carry the PIK1 NLR, uh, it's now a liability for the blast fungus, and it's uh, being detected through that HMA domain. There's a fascinating arms race going on here. Uh, AVRPIK comes in uh, four flavors. There are four variants. And these variants are polymorphic in four amino acids. And amazingly, these are the only four SNPs that are present in this gene. So all the four SNPs are non-synonymous. There is not a single synonymous substitution in this gene, which reflects uh, a very uh, rapid and very strong uh, selective pressure and very rapid evolutionary uh, adaptation going on uh, for the, in this effector. And then what's interesting is there are uh, also alleles of the NLR, which uh, detect these various uh, alleles of AVRPIK in varying degrees, as you can see here. Uh, PIKM, for example, can detect these three alleles, but not, not the last one. And if you look at the uh, NLR side, uh, it's also quite remarkable. If you look at the PIK1, which has the integrated domain, that's the most polymorphic uh, region in these receptors. And PIK2, which is an NLR partner, uh, the mate of PIK1 uh, is not so polymorphic, but uh, this is really a very clear signature of coevolution, of arms race coevolution between this effector and the NLR. So the reason I'm interested in this effect is we have uh, the capacity to study this at the biophysical levels. This is thanks to Mark Benfield, my colleague at the John Innes Center. And Mark and Abbas Makbul managed to get the structure of a complex between the effector, AVRPIK, and the uh, HMA domain, the integrated domain in the PIK1 NLR. And, and this was very uh, useful because, uh, first of all, it uh, allowed them to do some very... Uh, very extensive biophysical analysis, measure the binding affinities. And what was interesting is that the binding here is very important for the activity of this effector. So only this guy here, AVRPIKD, that binds at very high affinity to the integrated domain, only that one activates immunity and activate defense. And with varying alleles, now there's more data on this, clearly uh, binding affinity is very important for activating uh, a potent uh, response from the NLR. And, and that's, again, the structure. And you can see here that these four residues that are polymorphic, all four of them map into the interface. Uh, I cannot see it from here, but histidine, proline, glycine, and then the alanine, the other residues down here. So all, of, all four uh, have an impact on the binding interface, and, and all of them perturb the binding affinity uh, of this effector to the integrated domain. So this is quite extensive knowledge. Uh, about uh, this effector pair, which we thought we could, we could exploit to do uh, more things. So, uh, okay, so how can we exploit this knowledge? Back to wheat blast. So this is uh, a view of Magnapotheoriza, and as you heard already, this is a single species, but it's a collection of lineages that have different degrees of specificity. So this is rice blast. These are the strains that infect rice. And these are the ones that infect wheat, or some of the ones that infect wheat. And the Bangladeshi lineage is down here. So it's quite different from rice blast, but it's still uh, magnapotheorized. It's still uh, genetically about 99% identical to the rice blast strains. What's perhaps not surprising is that the effector repertoires tend to be very different. So you might ask the question, why can't you just take pick one, for example, from rice, introduce it in wheat, and then make a resistant wheat? But that doesn't work. It's not that simple. And the reason for that is AVRPIK, that effector I told you about, is only present in the rice strains. So in all that diversity I showed you there, only the rice strains carry AVRPIK. However, we noted that the other lineages uh, of Magnapothy carry paralogs of AVRK, members of the family of AVRPIK. And in particular, this guy here, AVRPIKL2, we call it, or APKL2, uh, for a PIK-like uh, uh, effector. This guy, which is about 60% identical to AVRPIK, and has more or less the same overall structure, is an interesting one. It's the most interesting member of the family, because that one is present in all the isolates of magnapotheorizing, including the one that infect wheat, including the Bangladeshi strains. So if you want to make a great NLR or great R gene against magnapotheorizer, you should really find an R gene that can bind to uh, APKL2, because that guy is everywhere. 
So, uh, so we looked at EPIKEL2. So this is a project of Thorsten Langner, and he started uh, studying these different members of the AVRPIK family. And what he found is EPIKEL2, just like AVRPIK, also binds HMA proteins. So that's good news. The bad news is that it doesn't bind the integrated domain. It doesn't bind the HMA that's integrated in PIK1. And uh, it's, you can see the data here. So this is EPIKEL2. Yes to hybrid assays. It binds a bunch of different HMAs, but it has a narrow range compared to AVRPIK and certainly doesn't bind to the integrated domain. So then Thorsten went and uh, generated structure of the complex between EPIKEL2 and one of the HMA that it binds. It's one of the HMA he picked from one of the grasses that he found as an interactor. And there was good news here because it turned out that the binding interface between this EPIKEL2, the AVRPIK paralog, and the HMA was fairly similar to the AVRPIK with the integrated HMA. So this allowed Thorsten to then make some, um, an interesting approach here, so make some guesses based on the structure, based on that binding interface. And, and identify uh, residues that are that binding interface that are polymorphic between the HMA that APKL2 bind to and, and then the integrated one, right? And so he started introducing these mutations and I identified in total nine different amino acids that are uh, polymorphic and predicted to uh, really impact the binding bit of these HMAs to APKL2. So he introduced them into the integrated HMA uh, introduced them different combinations. Single uh, introduction didn't have any impact. And in one case, when he introduced all nine amino acids, he could actually gain binding to APKL2. And you can see that here, this is, again, used to hybrid assays. So now this uh, integrated PIK1 HMA uh, carrying nine amino acids can bind to this new effector uh, APKL2, which is also present in the wheat blast isolates. So uh, this is, uh, to conclude, this is where we are. We're still doing the plant assays and the resistance assays, so that's work ongoing. But what we have done so far is we did actually create a new receptor in the sense that we now have a version of PIK1 with a modified HMA domain that binds a completely new, different effector from the original one. And this is an interesting effector because that effector is widely present in the Magnapotheorizes species, including in lineages that infect wheat and, and other plants. Maybe we can also make turf grass resistant and uh, save the golf courses. Perhaps this is a project that the current president of the United States would be really uh, favoring funding. Uh, and maybe this is one way to get his attention. Um, so, um, however, I have to say then, uh, that I don't think this particular configuration would be sufficient to uh, provide full resistance because we know that binding affinity is very important. So we may have to improve on the binding affinity between the integrated domain and EPIKEL2, but we could also introduce additional mutations uh, that will uh, sensitize the receptor or make it a bit trigger happy. And we know that we have to fine tune the, uh, the receptor really to make a new uh, effective resistance gene. It's not going to be sufficient, I think, to just take that, uh, those nine amino acids and introduce them. But this is the outlook. This is where we're heading. We think that by combining different classes of, of, um, of mutation, we'll be able to engineer uh, a new receptor against a completely new effector. But the, the really, the take-home message here is that it's important to understand how this immune receptors function at a fundamental level because that's knowledge that can be exploited uh, to, to really make new, uh, new synthetic receptors. And of course, all of this, uh, and uh, since I'm in Berkeley, I guess I have to mention that, all of this can also be uh, really uh, exploited by using uh, CRISPR and genome editing to introduce possibly just a few, uh, few uh, nucleotide changes into, back into these crop genomes to uh, introduce these synthetic uh, receptors and, and, and make resistant plants. So, uh, so that's the, the story. I want to thank many people. First, we had this fantastic team of uh, people who contributed to the Open Weed Blast project. We had 35 authors from uh, many different places who contributed various resources and analysis. And, and, um, uh, and, and uh, some of the key players are, are mentioned here. And I also want to thank Tofazal. And then uh, these are the guys in the lab who did a lot of the work. So half of the lab is on the BLAST uh, projects now. And in particular, I should highlight Torsten, who, um, uh, to, uh, who uh, did that work on the EPIKEL2, and also uh, Joe, who uh, was instrumental 
for uh, the Open Weed Blast project, and then uh, Claudia Sarai is now uh, helping with the um, uh, with the Weed Blast uh, diversity. And then, of course, my collaborators, in particular, Mark Benfield and uh, Rio Tarauchi, who are uh, our great collaborators on this blast work, and then my colleagues at the Science Bill Lab, and I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So maybe a question for Barbara, because you showed such a, a beautiful figure of that. I think it was the PW2 red, and there were only a couple of infected cells, but every cell you could see in the field still had some of the protein in the, in the nuclei. Yes. And this is just a technical point. Do you, do you have to provide the protein through the route of infection? Is it possible to, say, micro-inject recombinant PLW M cherry tagged into a cell and watch the translocation to other cells? Or does a micro-injection <laughs> Kill a kill a plant. So I, I just don't know technically right. because w with infection, so much is going on that you cannot attribute whatever you see changes in gene expression, whatever, to to that single protein. But if you could just micro inject each effector and test what's happening to the transcriptome in the you know in the marked cells, you could select. I don't know, maybe dissolve the walls with cellulite. I, I mean, I just don't know enough yeah, technically no. how to work with plants. Um, no, you're, you're right. We have not done that. Yeah. So um, we, we could do that. We, we have pretty much focused on the natural in infection so far. But I mean, we, we have started to do some bombardment experiments. So do transient expression. In, but that's interesting. Um, this is also a question for, for Barbara. It went by sort of fast. It seemed to, you seem to say that an AVRR interaction drove the evolution of MOL. Is that correct? No, okay. uh, not MOL. Of the, maybe you're, are you getting confused with my shorthand for the different lineages of Magnaportha, yeah. MOO? And, no, the R gene, periodic deployment of the R gene drove the evolution of AVRP to the corresponding uh, avirulence effector gene. And I can say that uh, pretty clearly because that's a gene family and a member of that family that isn't recognized, that has nothing, it doesn't have any activity towards the R gene, is stable on chromosome 7 throughout the whole Magnaportha group. So it's just the A virulence alleles that seem to be moving around. So it's nothing to do with MOL <laughs> or MO, MO. yeah. Um, I don't know if this is, is, makes any sense. Um, wait, is it possible that you can vaccinate plants with an A virulence strain? So I got the idea when um, yeah, that we were talking about you had a conditional mutant and then it, it triggered immunity, but it was avirulent. And I, was just, I know that plant, there's some kind of a long-term immunity as well in plants. I don't know any more about it, but I'm just wondering if you could use a strain like that or to, yeah, for, as like a vaccine. That, I mean, there are, there are examples where people have, have carried out um, they've shown induced resistance, but it's always been transient. So I think that any time anyone's ever tried that, particularly with effectors, they've had a transient response, but it's never been anything that you could sort of durably do in the same way as, as, uh, as yeah. There it is. Well, by control now, it's certainly uh, an option that people are looking at. It's using, using other microbes, right? to uh, either manipulate the philosphere or uh, even the rhizosphere. I mean, blast is also seed transmitted disease, so it might be possible to um, use other microbes to interfere with it. I guess the other thing that's worth mentioning, though, of course, is, that, is the interplay between, between immunity and growth and yield. So every time you know, people have used plant growth regulators to, to, to stimulate plant immunity, and there's very often been pleiotropic effects on, on yield. There's been a yield deficit as a consequence of that. So that's, that interplay, I think, is quite important in trying to look at any of those types of 
But if you, if you uh, were able to uh, immunize your field, if you knew enough, you could do so just the right time. Maybe you wouldn't inhibit growth. I yeah. mean, that's obviously yeah. where this is going. Can I ask a couple other questions myself? Did you have more? Okay, so this is very specific, Barb, and I just realized I've, you've probably published this, but is the BAS5 protein that actually spreads from cell to cell through PD or plasma desmata, is that, does that spread in any plant cell if you give it to any plant cell? I'm just curious. No, actually, some of the, some of the cells, it, it doesn't go into as much, or in particular, it doesn't get it out there. of yeah. as much. So but if you the put guard it there, cells it will move. It itself can transverse through the PD or through plasma desmata. Or? Right. Okay. Um, with a stipulation that we've only tried with fungal infection, and we haven't gotten it in there without the fungus. Okay. And then, can I ask one more, kind of a general question? So, um, when Nick was speaking, you know, and I was thinking, what we all think is, well, let's pretend in another world that GMOs were not unacceptable and, in fact, acceptable. And we were, and you, you've probably identified, in fact, some of the QTLs that you were describing as intergressing and, and whatnot. And then using CRISPR, of course, to uh, generate the recessive uh, resistance or yeah. inactivate susceptibility chains. So how much faster would your incredible work in, in the field and in uh, uh, application go? And just, just, <laughs> just, uh, Yes. Uh, how f much faster could you go and, and apply this work if those were uh, much, applicable? Much faster. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I know. I, I would say at least five times faster, I suspect. No, it would it's, be a, much it's a huge frustration yeah. because in particular, we can use the, the population biology to say these are the best genes for this population, and we could transform cassettes of several okay. genes in and the fungus would have a harder time keeping up right. with we, it. So I think we could uh, maybe move this out of the persistent problem for rice blast um, category if we had GMO technology. I know Sophia and I have complained maybe bitterly for at least 20 years yeah. about it, but nonetheless, yeah. importantly, I think underscoring is the fact that a lot of the resistance as well as the effector genes, they're linked, they're clustered, and therefore, again, genetics and intergression is really um, it's really hard. So yeah, and a bunch of the important ones for rice are at the centromere. So really, getting them in there is hard, very hard. Okay, I'll be quiet now. All right. I have one, one more in the back, and Jeff. Yeah. Oh, here we go. I, I think maybe to follow up on that, I, I wonder, uh, given even even if we can make the perfect. Uh, combination of AVR genes and so are, are we just buying ourselves some time <laughs> and then the pathogen will evolve or is there a point where you could actually get to an extinction that is to get to the point where now the Magnaportha can't grow at all and will never grow in, in these plants? Well, from my whole career working on this fungus, I never underestimate its ability to evolve. So I don't know if we're ever going to just solve the problem. And again, it's like the influenza situation in that there's a huge reservoir of, gla of grasses. So this fungus infects all grasses. So it's, it's the birds of the influenza wor world where there's still probably sexual recombination. There's a lot of recombination happening. So I, I don't know. But I it, can I ask before you, it be part to Jeff's point, is this only true of domesticated plants that you're seeing this, or is this happening in, 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 in native plants as well, this type of devastation? It's in native plants as well. Okay. Okay, so uh, the, the fungus infects grasses, period. So I, I'm beginning to think of it as a, a generalist. And we've realized now that some of the host specificity is these host species specific AVR genes. And what causes host jumps is when you lose the activity of the AVR genes. But it's definitely in the native grasses in Bangladesh. There was a, seemed to be a single introduction, but the big question is, of course, what's gonna happen when it recombines with the native grass uh, strains in Bangladesh? I think that the, the real, the lineage structure you're seeing uh, corresponds to domestication. So rice and foxtail millet were sort of first, and you've got those clusters. So there's clusters 
corresponding to the crops, but there's a bunch of strains that are sort of filling in that are native grasses. Okay, one more question. Let's make this the last one. To follow up on Dan's, where the problem with crops is they're genetically so similar that um, in a natural system, the hosts are typically genetically very different, so it's hard to have such a big epidemic unless you move a pathogen from one continent to another continent where it, uh, it encounters a naive host. But my question was, are, any, you know, are there any effectors that can't be lost from Magnaporthiorhizae? It looked like from Nick's table that, that there was some fungal strains that didn't elicit a response from any of the tester. I, I so. think that, that we, we haven't looked at them systematically enough to know the answer to that. I, I've always suspected there must be some, if you like, morphogenetic effectors where you'd see such a, such a penalty with them being missing that you would find some which were actually much, much more important than others. But we, we've yet to, we just haven't systematically gone through them enough to know that. The ones we've looked at so far, um, you know, there's a lot of redundancy. Although if you start doing mixed infections, you can see, uh, you can see fitness costs when you lose them. So you can see subtle phenotypes, but you're not gonna see them by spraying plants. You won't see them on terms of reduction in symptoms. But if you, if you do mixed infections over numerous generations to extinction, you can see that there is a, there's a fitness cost to, miss, to, 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 uh, to losing even some of these single effectors. So some of them do have fitness costs. Okay, thanks. Maybe we can move to the coffee break because we're already a little 50 minutes behind, sorry. All right, thank you so much for a very engaging session.